Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chats with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Good across everybody, welcome to episode number 80 of Baskets of Knowledge. Hopefully you've all had a fantastic week um, doing whatever you do and whatever part of the world you're in. Um, this is a very special episode, um, episode number 80. Um, when we started this one and a half years ago, we didn't think we'd get to episode number 80. And um, when I was thinking about who to get to episode number 80, there are some people that I think are pretty fantastic. As you know, we go around the country to pick fantastic people, but these two people that we've invited on today, I think are, are pretty amazing. And we really, really um, honored to have them on for our 80th episode. Um, Tane is not here today. He's off doing some pretty cool things um, as assistant coach. So hopefully we'll have some fun times there and he'll be back whenever he can jump on. So before we keep on rambling, I'm going to invite my two guests on, um, Samad and Rosia. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. No worries, no worries. Um, like I said, episode number 80 is special for us. Episode number 80 is special for our, our community. But the two of you are pretty special because and you, whether you know this or not, you have a pretty special place in my heart because I've gotten to see you for from a long, long time ago. And before we talk about what you're doing right now, um, let's start with let's start with Samad, I guess, and then we'll go to Uzair. Um, Let's talk about where you started. What are you both doing at the moment? And then we'll start about where you all started. So we'll go with Samad first, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's pretty crazy. Um, so I'm studying fourth year medicine at the moment. Um, if you asked me like about six years ago what I'd be doing, I probably wouldn't be medicine. Yeah, but yeah awesome. no, I'm just attracted at the moment, just really enjoying it. Oh, fantastic. Fourth year med school, and we'll talk about you know six years ago and what your dream was six years ago and what life was like six years ago. And is there what about you? What are you doing at the moment? Um, so at the moment, I'm in my final year of pharmacy, so fourth year of pharmacy at the moment. Um, yeah, and same as Ahmad, if you'd ask me few years ago before I met um, Pradesh, but I'd be doing it definitely wouldn't be pharmacy at Otago. So yeah, very, very pleased to be here and um, in my final year now. So yeah, and it's pretty awesome because both of you are professional programs, you know, to get to that stage, you have to go through health side first, which we'll cover in a bit. But let's talk about your journey before we even talk about coming to university. You both you've both come from from a from from a different background and did you grow up in New Zealand or did you grow up elsewhere and move to New Zealand and your family life? What is that like? Um, yeah, so we were actually both born in Pakistan, um, but we came down when we were, we were like really young, so like about two years old. Um, yeah. yeah, and basically been raised here, I guess. Oh, fantastic. And what is that like for your family? Because, you know, um, um, families that come from, from anywhere in the world, you know, when the young people are born into the country, the young people are part of the country, but your parents and your family are still living in a world that is still very different. So that would have been interesting for you growing up when in a world that is, I guess, two different worlds or three different worlds because you have um, your Pakistan culture, you have your your New Zealand culture, and then you have your blend of the two. What is that like for, for the two of you? Yeah, no, I, I guess like, like, you know, your parents are teaching you something, and then you go outside, you know, and then everyone's doing something completely different. You just kind of like, you, you, don't, you don't know what's right, what's wrong. You don't know what to follow, I guess. It's like in a way, like, um, yeah, I don't know if Fuzil wants to talk a bit more about it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a bit different. So we we came from we came from Pakistan here, and obviously, uh, before then, that's just what our parents taught us. So they taught us Urdu, so that's what we speak. Yes. Um, even even till this day, like when we go home, we still talk with them in Urdu, and that's how they kind of kept it. I'm um, starting off with uh, schooling and everything like that. We we went out there, and because we're so new to it, and our parents didn't really teach us. We and uh, it, it was kind of like. We kind of just picked it up ourselves from our um, our surroundings because I remember going to school for the first time here and I just had no idea what the teachers were saying, even though they were reading a, a story to to the kids. And I remember my mom being there near me and she was trying to explain to me what the teacher was saying. And so because you're very young and you pick up things quick, it's just like reading the environment and reading people's mouths and what they're saying and kind of just making your own interpretation of how it is. And that's how one day you get along down the journey and you realize, ah, oh, I can speak English all of a sudden like magic. So yeah, you know, uh, kind of like that. Yeah, I, I, I bring that because, you know, I grew up, my my, my family arrangement is interesting because I grew up in Zimbabwe. My dad is from Africa, we there, lived his whole life. My mom was from India. So growing up in a crazy world where you have Indian culture and African world going on, Indian 
it's just so crazy because like you said before at home you speak one language when you leave the house you speak another language and when you come home you're like what when your brain is all over the place and then and then you meet people from different cultures like what is going on here it's a, it's a pretty crazy crazy thing but like you said there in some is when you're young everything just comes into play it's probably a bit harder for for our parents you know who come into a place where they have to try and relearn and also try and hold on to the heritage and the culture that they come with, which is a whole different different space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, my dad has been here for years now. He's been here for like over 20 years, but his accent is like still the same. You know what I mean? Whereas like yeah. me and my brother, we've kind of, I remember we did have a, like a bit of an accent at the start and it kind of just like went away as we as we went on. But yeah, no, definitely. definitely. I feel like um, there's, there's a certain age, I feel like when, um, I feel like it's very hard to get that but I feel like because we were here so young we kind of just instantly got integrated into the the Kiwi culture and um and what was it like for you as, as brothers going going to school um you know in, in Christchurch you know Christchurch is an interesting city it's um it's got its pros it's got its cons um it's an interesting space you know I when I go to Christchurch I'm like it's a great place but also sometimes it's got a bit of a bit of an undercurrent what is it like for you both I guess like at the start in like primary school, we were like put, put both together in like the same class, you know, everything was going good, you know, what not, but I think like, I, I, looking back now, I kind of like disagree with what they did. They, they tried to like split us apart. They like put us in like different classrooms. And yeah. like looking back now, I don't think that was like the best thing, honestly, because like you kind of just end up just like, uh, like it's good in the sense that, you know, you do get to spend time with like different people, but I feel like, like that did kind of like, you know, like the kind of already causing like a separation already. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, de- yeah, no, definitely. So, like, with with the schooling growing up, um, and and Christchurch, yeah. So, it was it was it was kind of different. Um, I feel like um, the the school that we went to is not necessarily like the best. I feel like for what our parents wanted for us, but it was definitely like a, a place where I kind of made like a lot of friends growing up. And like Samad is saying, like we got split off really early on, um, in the schooling. So like I didn't actually see him quite a lot. And I, I think that's where I, I think it caused like a, a lack of communication and interaction between me and him for quite a long time because we kind of just went out separate ways kind of, and I didn't really see him much and I was just kind of doing my own thing and he was kind of doing his own thing as well. So in that respect, I don't feel like it was the best, especially for us both. Um, yeah. And I, and I guess it's something you pick up now as you get older, you know, at that time, like, yeah, whatever it is, what it is. And, you know, you, you listen to the school, the teachers, doesn't, your parents and your teachers and you go, right, cool, whatever. But like you said, mm-hmm. Samad, when you look back and Azir, when you look back, you go, I don't know if that was the right thing for you to do, but hey, you are where you are right now. And who knows what would happen if you're together? You might, you might have had a different story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> different, exactly different, yeah. different life story. And um, and health conditions. I know that health has also been really, health Health is interesting because I know Azir, we'll talk about your, your gym work a bit later on, but health has not always been the best for you, right? So, Mar, there's been some some journeys around along that. Do you want to talk about that and how that's how that's been that journey for both of you as well? Yeah, no, definitely. I've always just like a, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I've always just been like a pretty healthy kid. I used to like never yeah. go to the doctor. Though. Like I used to like never miss any days at school. Um, yeah, I would always be going to school, never miss out. And then yeah, one day all of a sudden I just had like this lump on my neck. Yeah. And yeah, it was kind of like, I didn't really think much of it. I told my mum and she was like, oh, yeah, that's quite normal. You know, everyone gets it when they get like a flu or something, you know? And I was like, yeah. okay, cool. You know? And um, literally like, you know, the next day like grew like two, three times the size. And I was like, oh, mum was like, okay, let's go. I'm get it checked out. And like the doctor kind of just reassured me. He was like, oh, it's quite normal, you know, especially in winter, you know, it's usually just a sign of like a viral infection. Um, probably nothing, you know? And so, How yeah, we did you? some blood Holy so what? Oh, yeah, so, oh yeah, so this was in year 12, um, okay. like towards the end of year 12. So I was like yes. getting close to just getting my exams. Yes. Um, so the externals, you know, yeah. And so, yeah, no, so I, I, I'm quite optimistic. So I was kind of, you know, I was like, oh, it's probably just nothing. But at the same time, I was doing my Googling. <laughs> we all do, right? We all do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and Googling wasn't looking too good <laughs> as Google, you know, it says, yeah. you know, everyone's going to die if you just search up anything. But yeah, the doctor was just reassuring me and we did the blood test, Blood test came back normal, which, you know, you would think would be a good thing. But in this case, it wasn't because you like, you don't want to find like this, like a high, like, like, you know, white blood, like, white blood count or something like that. But yeah. it came back pretty normal, which was like kind of concerning for the doctor. Um, so then he kind of um, told me a bit more about the possibilities that it could be. He thought it like it could possibly be like TB just because yeah. I am from Pakistan. It's a yes. higher like incident. 
but like I, I hadn't had any like recent contacts with anyone from Pakistan so I was like like surely not and he did tell me there would be like a pretty small chance that it could be like a cancer but he said not to worry about it like that's really rare and like so yeah we did like a, a biopsy a needle biopsy so they just got like a sample from um, like the, the lump in my neck and um yeah so they ended up finding um like a Reed Stenberg cell um so yeah so he just basically called me in called my parents in um my dad went and yeah he basically just um yeah serious look on his face he just like closed the door just closed the curtains and yeah just sat down and just said, told me you know there was no easy way to he basically said these ex exact exact words there's no easy way for me to tell you this but um you most likely have cancer and yeah and and in, in that moment I, I was kind of like I wasn't like like shocked or like sad I kind of I don't know I was kind of in a sense expecting it for some reason just from all the googling yeah so I kind of just smiled but like yeah I'm, I'm not the best at receiving information so and plus I was a kid so I was quite like optimistic I was like oh yeah you know it's gonna it's like a it's just like another like condition that's just gonna get cured yeah so uh, it didn't really affect me at all but um but when I went back home and then you know when my dad told my mom like she just started like bursting out crying and that's when it really like hit me like about the severity of the condition, I guess. Yeah. And I guess as you, as you when you've heard this news, what is it like for you? Because I mean you guys are, you you were pretty close now and you're in school in the same, you're in the same classes and stuff. What is that like for you? I feel like for me, looking back now, it didn't really hit me at the moment. Like I was in the room with everyone else and when the news was given and I was like, okay, well, I wasn't looking at the I wasn't looking at the downsides. I was like, wait, what are the well, what can we do about this? And the, the doctor had a funny way of explaining that, oh, if you're gonna if you want to get a type of cancer is this one right so i was like oh okay right so there's a very high success rate and obviously like me being a kid i'm just like i feel like going into it i didn't want to like over stress myself like straight off the bat right and just like be like oh man this is like this is like you know this is so so bad what's gonna happen right i've just always had like a way of just dealing with like things especially like bad news in a way of just like calm, being calm about it so i just thought like okay well the doctor's being pretty nice about it he's saying that there's you know he's gonna have to go through some um he's gonna have to go through the the procedure with people with cancer right like the chemo and the medications but you know there's a very high success rate of this so that's how it kind of went for me at the start um just absorbing it was like well okay everything's been fine with our family you know we've, we've always been sick we've had shit like this you know and then it's get, yeah. it gets better later on so i thought this is just going to be one of those things that just happens in our life it's just that obstacle and then hopefully as you get down the line everything's going to be all good and i feel like it started um the whole thing started hitting me more and more as when some art started actually going through the medications and the therapy um because i remember like with the, with the whole chemo thing it's kind of just like eating you from the inside out you're not exactly you anymore and like seeing the changes um that was happening to him like his uh the changes in his facial shape the loss of hair just like his overall mood i remember I, w I went into his room one day and i was just there and i was gonna ask how he's doing or something and he just instantly just started crying and it was just it was just so hard like i just i just didn't know what to do in that moment i just like didn't know how i could like help him in that moment so my way of like dealing with that was just just leaving him there I was just like um leaving him there by myself by, by himself which you know I just I feel like looking back now wasn't wasn't the best way to kind of so go about it it's so hard right it's so hard you don't know what to do and, and I, before we talk about that I like what the two of you said you know um so you're like okay I googled it I was half expecting that and so you're like oh the doctor put a positive spin so you focus the positive it's so crazy whenever when you, when you get bad news you try and focus on the, the one positive thing, even in the amongst 99 bad stuff, there's that one percent you got right club and the focus on that thing. At, at that point in time, you know, I remember when my mom was also diagnosed with cancer, I remember my dad called and said, hey, so the way it works in our family is my parents live in Zimbabwe and um, we never, we, we, we always call them, they never call us. And when they called, I was like, oh, why is my dad calling? This is a bit weird. And you know, when, when they call it, oh, something's not right there. And my dad's like, da, 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 da. just happy, happy, happy. It's like, Dad, why are you calling me? You need to tell me why you're calling me. And then that's when the news is broken. And I was like, whoa, you know, and I just tried to, you just try to find the positive. Oh, no, don't worry. They've called it early, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And you just pick on that one positive. You just pick on, and it's only later on when it becomes real. And, and it's always hard because you're not the person going through it. You're the person observing it. So you just watch it from the outside. And 
the person going through has a whole different different journey altogether. So you know, um, it's so hard. It's so I mean, it's so hard for I guess for Uzera myself as observers and Samad, you have a whole different experience which you know, no none of us can know about because it's your, it's your journey that you've gone through. But as you go through it, Samad, so you this have you know you've been diagnosed with cancer and what is that like for you because now you're in year 12 as you said before you were healthy everything was all hunky dory and then life just throws a curveball and you know you like i was here i was saying you go through treatment and treatment is we all have heard and seen what cancer treatment is like and what is that like for you going through the journey there if you can express that in words i guess yeah and no, it's, it's kind of um kind of funny from my side of point of view like I wasn't really concerned about the cancer so I was more concerned about my exams in that moment like I remember the doctor told me he's like you have any questions I was like straight away like 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 how's this gonna affect like me sitting my exams like will I still be able to sit them he kind of just told me you know like like, you won't have to sit them you know we'll just be able to you know do a doctor's note and I was like okay cool Um, but I was just I was literally just stressing out all about my internals my externals because like at that moment in time I just had this goal of just trying to get into medicine and I was like yo this is gonna like it just looked like a big hurdle in the way so yeah. I was more so focused about that also yeah I was quite naive I guess in, in a sense you know um yeah so I was kind of just thinking like you know the doctor told me like you know really high success rate you know of like treatment and whatnot so I was like oh, okay this is just like you know just a just a, a like a, a worse version of like a cold you know we're, we're gonna beat this person in like a few months yep so I was just like oh like you know happy happy going into like treatment you know like like a naive little kid and then when they finally started me on chemo, like, yeah, no, my perception of it all just changed. Yeah. Like at that moment, it's like, like the chemo is actually, it's actually insane. So how it basically works is this, it, you're basically in trying to like, um, like kill off the cancer, you're basically just nuking your whole body um, in a sense. So yeah, you basically just, you feel like, I just felt like probably like the worst I've ever felt in my life. You just feel like absolute shit. And um, like, I don't know, you, like that first day, I just felt so anxious and like, just like, I don't know, like, depressed and like with the hospital environment it's just all white walls um and you you get like that sterile smell as well and imagine just being stuck there for like weeks on end it's just yeah yeah that, that first night just yeah hit me the most um I remember like I told her yeah because my mom like she was she was always like the most weird she was like I'm gonna stay with you tonight you know what not what not I was like no mama you know this is like easy you know like you know you don't need to stay and you know when the chemo finally hit me I was like oh wow like yeah, I, you know, oh man yeah 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 it was crazy because I was just on my bed and um I remember I just wanted like some fresh air I was just feeling so like trust like claustrophobic um and whatnot and I was just kind of like begging the nurse I was like yo can, like I, I really just want to go outside you know I, just, I like the sterile smell was just getting to me the white walls I just want to see you know go outside see nature just get that smell the nurse was like no we, we can't let you go outside you know it's like your first day we don't know if you're gonna faint or whatnot and I just started crying to her mm-hmm. and like yeah she she actually he actually was really nice she let me go outside and it was in that moment I kind of like she let me go over like the bridge, go see the river. And in that moment, like the first like whiff of like fresh air, like, oh my gosh, okay. Like it was actually insane. Like I didn't actually realize like how much like I took that for granted, I guess, in a sense. And like I was never like a and like a nature type of person. Like I never understood why what why people would go to like see mountains or like go on like, you know, hikes and all that. I was like, you know, you could just Google them, you know, got Google images, search stuff there, you know, why why do you need to go see it in real life? But in that moment, just looking at the river, just looking at the birds, and I was like, wow, like, like this is what I was taking for granted all this time when I'm just like bedridden now. But it's 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 really crazy, and and I love how you brought that back to um taking things for granted because before we started the the conversation, Jose spoke about being grateful, and you know I don't think a lot of us are very grateful. We live live our lives just on a constant, you know, we just do things because we're meant to be doing. And I guess when things happen, that's when you go, actually, wait a minute, I didn't appreciate life. And for you, unfortunately, this is what happened for us to appreciate life. Um, Mm -hmm. I say unfortunate because no one likes to be sick and no one likes to be sick in any way. But hey, this happened here. So you go go through that day and you go through your your chemo. And what is it like as you as you near the end of it and and i guess is there for you watching from the outside you know as you said it's really hard because you can't tell it. and also your, your family so someone is going through the treatment mom and dad are obviously going through the emotions is there you you there trying to be the best that you can what is that like for you all as a family unit <clears throat> um it's, it's it's different i feel like i i knew that i couldn't do anything for him right it's it's, a, it's like a feeling of like like not feeling like you 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 can be there for that person you know altogether all I could be there is like just give support right because at the end of the day I'm not walking in his shoes so like I I've, uh, like a 
like what's that what's that what's that word when you you don't feel like you're you're any help to anyone right no matter what you do is this kind of how i felt i kind of just observed him from the outside right and i made my own interpretation and i just knew that he was just going through somehow i knew he was going through like one of the worst things that could probably happen to a human being right and the whole chemo process but i just feel like i couldn't be there you know i just didn't really feel like anything i could do would be of any help to him so i just it kind of made me feel a bit useless, you know, and and what he was going through, right? And I just didn't really feel like I could be much help. And I felt like it was kind of the same for our parents in a sense of way. All mum mum could do was she could just pray, right? And we could all just pray because we're we're religious, right? We're Muslim. So mum, mum and dad were all just like praying every single day, you know, like a lot, just praying to God that hopefully like this becomes better because despite the doctor saying that hey look there's a very high success rate right you never know you know and uh, yeah. we have family members that have passed away due to cancer right so yeah. it was for my mom especially right because her mom and dad passed away from a different type of cancer each so for her it was probably the most the most stressful as well um so she was just constantly praying and praying to god that everything will be fine um, yeah and and um thank you for sharing that and i, I empathize with that because like i said my mom when she was diagnosed with cancer. I had the exact same feeling that you had as when I when I saw her going through chemo. And my mom is my superhero. I think she's the most amazing person. And when she was crying, I've never seen my mom cry before in my life. And seeing her crying because she's in so much pain and you're just helpless, like you can't do anything. And your dad is helpless as well. You know, um, what do you do? You know, you can just be there for them. And then you just start praying. You know, you just even if you're not a believer at that point in time, you start believing and you go, right, hey, wait a minute. I need to stop praying and, you know, just put your faith into, into the higher being because, you know, yeah, we have medication and stuff, but as we all know, you know, there is someone out mm-hmm. there that is looking out for us and, you know, we just, we just ask and go. So I empathize with you. And like you said before, you were not going in there through the, through the journey. So you just do what you can and you just feel so helpless. Um, mm-hmm. And for me, it was, it was crazy hard because I was so far away as well, you know, living here in New Zealand, my parents in Zimbabwe, that was even, even hard. So I can just empathize with you being right there and you see it all unfolding. And so, much, so you go through your journey. We're not going to spend too much time on here because we want to talk about the other cool things. You go through the journey. We're not going to go into that there. When do you get told, hey, you're now, okay, you're, you're, you're clear. How long was that journey? Oh, so, yeah, no, so I, I'm, I got quite lucky. Um, I, I found out about it like pretty early on. So um, yeah. it was pretty early stage. And so it was only three months of treatment, which is like yeah. amazing um, in a sense. So, but even though I was clear after three months, um, the side effects of chemo, I, I think I'm still living them, living with them today. So yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just chemicals, right? In your body. That's what it is. It's just, just like, like, I like the Zia's um, um, description. You're just nuking your body from inside, essentially. Right. So let's fall on. So you do that there. You, you obviously three months. Yeah. Happy days. You can write your exams. I don't know if you do, but you go into year 13. Now year 13 comes along. Fresh new stuff for the two of you. Um, you're finishing off your schooling career at Shirley Boys and university is popping up for you. What are you both thinking at that point in time? Given now, because obviously you've gone through this year, you've come become close as a family unit, that mm. university university changes for you. What is that like for you both as you start thinking about year 13 and then after year 13? Uh, yeah, so um, it was kind of different. So before, before even um, getting to that phase, we 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 had this we had this stage in life where our family uh mum and dad were kind of going through like quite a lot they were having like like trouble so we we ended up going to pakistan for what was supposed to be like a three month family trip mum goes to her side of the family you know yes. take some time off dad goes to his side of the family takes some time off and then it ended up being a, a nine month um wow. trip overall and uh, what what happened here was me and my brother actually got admission to school there in Pakistan, which was like a big big shift in our life. So during this time we were supposed to be in the year eight, so we just finished off one year in Kirkwood Intermediate, which was a really a really good year um, yeah. for me. And I'm sure for my brother as well. And then we instantly had this massive switch where family problems started occurring. We went to Pakistan only for a short break, ended up being nine months. We got admission to school there. And so the school that we got admission to there was one of the one of the richest private schools you could probably get admission to in in, in Pakistan, um, and um, we just didn't know what we were kind of getting out getting our feet into, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we we started going there, 
And instantly, like the, f the first day in, we had trouble. I think I almost got into a fight because of something that I said that would be considered a joke, that would be very lightheartedly taken in New Zealand. And obviously, these kids have big egos. They come from very wealthy families. Instantly, just like didn't take it, um, started being really, really aggressive. And from that moment on, I, I just knew this was going to be a very, very difficult year. We didn't get, I didn't get any of the social um, situations. I just didn't know how to be friends with anyone there. Uh, the way that people kind of have um, a way of saying things or like communicating in a way which will be friendly is a lot different from um, New Zealand where we, we had been kind of growing up. Um, and on top of that, um, just realized how hard the study was going to be, which was a big hit. We went from having no homework at all in New Zealand, barely anything to do, to just full grind study to the point where it was literally you you get to school every day, you're, you're attentive, you're trying to absorb everything in, and then you have homework to do. You go home, you, you grind out the homework, right, and then get ready for tomorrow, which they will then assess what you learned prior to. Um, so it was just like, waking up early morning, going to school, learning at school, coming home, studying, having Quran class, and then studying all night. And then with being in a third world country and in Pakistan, we have low cheating. The power would cut out at a certain time of the day. You, I remember like sitting there with like my, like my candle, lit, trying to like read through shit just so I can get ready for tomorrow's lesson. And that was a, that was a big point because um, all of a sudden, we went from doing nothing at school to having this extreme pressure um, to do good. And then our dad being really disciplined and like really hard on us as he is, was literally just forcing us to do it. It was pretty much that like, you you have to get through this or, you know, there'll be consequences, right? So having, having no choice and having to go through that, literally just like getting down and just grinding every single day, getting tutors. Um, and that's, uh, that's when I like started, um, I completely quit my sporting pretty much altogether. Um, I went from like um, doing sports every single day to doing nothing except just literally just being arched and just like moving back and forth and just writing shit over and over and over and over again until like um, me and my brother got it. Um, but also during this time of hardship where I, I had given, like we had been given no choice was a very big time which I learned about, um, I got a deeper understanding about human adaptation. It was like, it was so tough at the start that I was, I was literally struggling. I just, I just knew I just had to keep going through. And then it's like one month in, automatically you start noticing this natural shift where things aren't as difficult as they once were. And it was, it was such an, an insane feeling. I remember it was like all of a sudden, all this, all the stuff that was very hard was becoming easier. And it's like, I realize how humans like um kind of adapt to situations when they're when they're put in and they have no choice, right? It's like you 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 will find a way to to figure it out. And I feel like those mechanisms were being tested during that time. And it's like all of a sudden all this stress and hardship started becoming easier and easier. It's like the answers were like being given. And and um uh, fortunately at the end of that year, me and my brother both passed um that year, which was like a big, a big celebration. But um it was it was one of those big obstacles that I feel like um, we both overcame, and it was it was very tough. But I feel like it instilled with the within us like a type of discipline. It almost showed us like where the limits are, like how much a human can handle, as well, and how quickly humans can adapt. Um, if if say like you don't have a way out, you just have to do it, right? Um, yeah, and I feel like that's one of the things that kind of helped me get through where I did past high school and getting into university was like whenever I thought I was uh, I was inadequate or whenever I thought I just didn't have what it takes to keep up with the workload I always thought back to when I was 13 years old or however old I was when I was in Pakistan and I was just on that grind you know and I, it, it was that one thing that I had that I can convince myself that at that time in my life I did I, I showed myself that I do have what it takes so it kind of just negates all the negative self-talk that we have within ourselves sometimes is just that that period in time and I feel like even to this day I look back to that time when it was very difficult and we still managed to get through um, yeah and, and I guess you know it's, it's so crazy because you've gone from one extreme to the other extreme you know very very chill New Zealand lifestyle is very very chill to a place that is the total opposite like you said you know um 
and it was just mm. reverse for me. I came from Zimbabwe. It was everything was challenging. Reverse, the so same thing. Load shedding. You got to do the. You, if you don't, if you don't study, your life is going to be pretty tough. Essentially, you know, same thing. Pakistan. If you don't get the grades, your life is going to be pretty tough. And everyone's on the grind. And mm-hmm. then I come to New Zealand. And everything's so chill. I was like, I go to class, and they're like, Oh, you don't have to come to class, or you don't have to do the work. I'm like. What are you talking about? This is so crazy. I've come from a place where you've got to go to lectures, you've got to, you've got to know your lectures, you've got to go to every class, the attendance. If you don't get 70%, you're failing. And like, it was just so crazy. And I come here and I was like, oh, you get 95%. No worries. Like, 95%? What are you talking about? You've got to be a genius. So um, it's, it's a reverse role there, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. But I, I, love, I love the context because it then talks, of, it just shows those formative years have, have basically given you the grounding, like you said, was here to think about where you both have achieved right now. So, you know, if you, if you think back, like you said, you know, you think about that formatively, actually it's changing hard at the start. And, you know, when we come and talk about what you, what you guys are doing right now, you can think about that could be the formative years when this actually has instilled something in your life that would probably never happen if you had, hadn't had those nine months in Pakistan. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like those those were some of the key events that which eventually led us to where we are now. And and like like you were saying, once once that year was done and we came back to New Zealand, it's like, oh, man. You know, like we've got a nice, nice bed to lay on, like a nice comfy bed. We we have nice warm, warm shower, showers. You know, we have toilets that aren't built ground level. You know, we don't have to, you know, go all the way down. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. It was like it was it was a lot of gratification. It was like it was we went from New Zealand having such an easy life, right, which we took for granted, to coming to Pakistan and having it all taken away, and then going back to Pakistan. I just felt so grateful um, that we have had all these things and. If I hadn't gone to Pakistan and had that experience, I would have never been grateful for what I had. And so coming back to New Zealand was a big, like, like a relief. It was like, wow, you know, like everything is so great. Coming back to no homework, you know, and it was that that year put us two years ahead of everyone else. So yeah. literally when we, when we got to high school, it was two years of literally just them feeding us the same stuff that we learned in like nine months. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was so chill. And uh, I feel like then I got I got back into my sporting again because uh, I I had done nothing for like the past nine months and it took a good six months to get back up um, to where I was physically and um, after after that year I kind of just like I I just took it a bit easy I feel like on the study and I went back into the sporting um, and I yeah and then eventually got to the point where I was finishing high school and I was like oh I got to get serious again and yeah that. that will take us to the next part of the journey i guess yeah. Yeah, totally so much you add do you add to that that um that was really really informal that was just an amazing amazing story that was a so much you add to that yeah no, yeah no definitely they did a pretty good job of telling the story um yeah no, that was like probably like the key moment within my life that kind of like it shifted my whole mindset like i used to think like when i was a kid i used to think there's the smart people and then there's people that are dumb and i used to put myself in like the the not so smart category um yeah. i was always doing like I was always doing either average or like below average. I remember like one time in English, like they, had, they made us do like essay. The teacher told me I, I didn't, I like I, I failed it or like, you know, was doing below standard. And then like, she was like, I can let you do another essay. And I literally just plagiarized that essay from like online. And she was like, okay, you passed. Like, it was like that bad for me. Yeah. Like in, in the case, like even with like mass tests, like um, we used to do yeah. like these mass tests where you do the times tables and like the, the person that once you finished, you just say, you know, you're done. I would literally just write the wrong answers, like all wrong answers, say I'm done, and then mark it myself. And you like, it was, <laughs> like it was that yeah. bad for me. And then like the whole Pakistan experience just completely changed that. I realized it wasn't about like being smart or dumb. It's, it's literally all about just the amount of effort you put in and how much you're willing to just, you know, like work to get to where you want to be. And yet, and from that point onwards, I was like, wait a minute, you know, like, it's not that I'm smart. It's not that I'm dumb. It's just, I just needed to like, just work hard, you know, and that's all, that's all it was. And so. Yeah, I just started. I just started working hard, um, you know, all throughout high school, and it was just so easy. You literally only need to do a few hours outside of school, um, and then you're literally getting the best grades. It was like that, and that was just such a like a. If I didn't go to Pakistan, I honestly would not be here, like where I am today. I'd probably just be in the same mindset, you know, thinking I'm just like an average person, or you know, I can't do these things. When it's really just about just giving it, you know, like checking in a few hours every day, and just seeing where that takes you. Um. So yeah. Um. So I always wanted to do uh, medicine, like ever since I was a kid. Um, I think it was kind of like my granddad that kind of like kind of instilled that in me in Pakistan. Um, and being a Muslim, um, like in the Quran, it says like if you save one life, as if though you've saved the whole of humanity. So I, I think it was like a, a, you know a lot of like reasons like 
like religiously as well. It's like, you know, if I can get a job in which I can get paid, but also help people, like how good is that? When, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And just all through high school, I was just studying like sciences and math and like, doing pretty well. I was like, oh, you know what? I really enjoy this. And I was like, you know, what? I really enjoy talking to people as well. And, yeah. you know, I'm getting leads. So it's like, why, why not? Why not medicine? Um, but yeah, but then like the whole cancer journey, um, a lot of people thought that, like when I told them about it, they were like, oh, is that why you chose to do medicine? It was actually kind of the complete opposite. It kind of threw me away from medicine. Yeah. Because with chemotherapy, um, there's so many side effects. There's a, there's a term co called chemo fog, brain fog. Um, and so what happens is you basically just have like a bunch of fog over your head. Um, you can't really concentrate as well as you used to. You can't really, um, yeah, you struggle to um, pick things up. Um, even when people were talking to me, it'd be going in this year, out the other. Yeah. Um, and with the reading um, like books at all, like I'd have to read the same line like 10 times and sometimes it still wouldn't register. It, it got like that bad. So I was like, yo, I, I don't think I'd be able to um, get into medicine. Yeah, it was kind of like that. But then as year 13 kind of went went like by, like the, the brain fog started getting less and less. And I started like getting back to like um, the my mental capabilities that I had before. Um, but by that time, I'd, I'd already decided, you know, uh, medicine's not for me. You know, I'm not I'm not smart enough to do this anymore. I'll, I'll, you know, I might as well try something else like engineering. Um, and I remember I I told you that I wanted to do medicine when you first like came down. And then when you came back down, I remember this is like such an insane story because if you hadn't have came down that day, I, I wouldn't be studying medicine, but I can't explain what happened. So um, so, you, so you told me to apply for like every scholarship. Like, it, yeah, so that's what I did. I just applied for every scholarship. Even though I wasn't going to go to Dunedin to study medicine, I still applied for um, Otago because you told me to. Um, and so, um, yeah, I remember um, you came down that day to talk to like scholarship winners because I ended up getting a scholarship for Otago. Um, and I remember the creator's advisor, me and Azir were in the library, I remember. Right, Azir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, me and Azir were in the library that day and the cruise advisor came to us and he was like, oh, Fajish has come to talk to the scholarship winners. And I'm, and I'm literally telling him, like, like we're not going to Otago. We're not going to... Yeah, yeah. I was like, we don't want to go. We don't go. Like, we're literally point. telling this guy we don't want to go. And he, yeah. he literally did it like, like five times to us or something. And I was like, no, we're not going. We're not... He literally forced us to go. Like, yeah. he, did not, he did not force us to go. Like, oh my God, we wouldn't be in Dunedin. We, I'd be doing something completely different. But the fact that he forced me to go, I then met you there and then you asked, you know, I... I just straight away told you, I was like, I'm not going to um, Dunedin. I'm, I'm doing engineering. Yeah. And at first you, were, you said something funny. You were like, oh, how much do they pay you? It's a funny joke. <laughs> but then but then you were like, why do you, why honestly though, why do you want to do engineering, you know? And when you said that to me, like, I kind of just had like a mind, like there was, there was no like actual genuine reason I did want to do it. And yeah, I was just kind of like, yeah. And then you, you, you told me, this is, this, is, this is like the deep words you told me, you were like, you know, like if fear is like the reason, the only reason that's stopping you from pursuing like what you really want to do, then that's like a really shitty reason. And that kind of like really hit me because it really just made me realize that, um, yeah, medicine was, was the thing that I always wanted to do. And it was just fear. It was just the fear of not getting in that was really just stopping me. Um, and from that on point onwards, you kind of just, you know, you just told me, you know, like the whole process and just, just you know, made it a lot simplified and yeah. That day, I just went home to told my mom, you know, I'm doing medicine now. <laughs> I'm going to Otago. She was like, what the hell? She was like, you just switched up. Like, up the whole year of telling me you want to do engineering, you know, you come back home. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'll, 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 tell my, I'll tell my version in a second. Was there, what about yourself? So, yeah, you were, you were in year 13. It's all the same story. You you obviously were in the library. There. I'll, I'll, before I even talk about that there, when I came to school, your cruise advisor forgot I was coming. I forgot I was coming. I, I pushed up at school and I was like, hey, I'm here. And I was like, oh, he was like, oh, damn. And I was like, I'm just going to find some people for you. And I was like, that's, that's, because if you notice that day, it was just a random collection of people that, that came in. And he yeah. totally forgot that I was coming in there. And he said to me, no, I'm going to go get some people. And I was like, it's okay. It's okay, Mr. Russell. You don't have to. It's like, no, I'm going to go find some people. And that's how all of you came in. And um, yeah, over to you, is it? Yeah, no, I, I remember I remember these events as well. So pretty much the whole situation with me was okay, I'm getting near I'm getting at the end of the year uh, year 13. It's, it's time things are getting serious. It's time to look forward to what else is out there. And I remember around this time I was I was way more in my um I was way more in my sporting. I was I was going through um weightlifting and I was gymming and I was um doing badminton and all that. And I was I was touching up on on, on study and all that as well, but I was like after the whole Pakistan situation, I'd kind of just like um, chilled out on that quite a lot. I missed I missed the whole sporting side of things quite a lot, and I I, I really it's all I did growing up as well. I was just big into running and athletics and all that. So I kind of just stopped studying as hard after the Pakistan thing and just started going into my sporting a lot. 
And um, during this time, it was coming up to year 13. And I feel like the Pakistani incident, those nine months, I literally, every test, I literally would just study maybe like a week before, maybe like even a few days prior to, and I would just nail it. And it would, it would be pretty good. It was pretty good, I guess. And now we're coming into year 13, and it's just the final year, and it's time to look ahead. Around this time, I was I was more into just doing business side of things. I think I was I had my dad's kind of like charisma for business. I was buying and selling stuff on Facebook Marketplace, but then I really got into um, buying and selling shit off China. I got into like, the Chinese market, and I noticed that there was um, fuel prices were going up, and then uh, I started buying electric like um, scooters and stuff from China, and I started working my way up, and I worked my way up to. Um, electric motorbikes that could go like 100 kilometers an hour and you can just charge them with like a the same charger you you charge your iphone with so i was making a decent amount of money and i told dad like hey look i bought my first car with my own money my, my laptop my phone i don't i've got my weightlifting here you know I've, I've got my sporting here um i've got all my friends here i've got you guys here i don't really want to go to i don't know if university is really for me i want to do business and stay here do my weightlifting and then Dad was pretty much like he's he's been through all that before, you know. He's he kind of just like, hey, look, son, I'm doing business. My dad sells cars. He's got a car yard. He's like, hey, son, I sell. You know, I've been doing business. I've done this for years. You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Like if one day your business fails, what are you gonna do? You know, you don't have anything to fall back on. How about you go to university, right? Get a degree. And then once you get that degree, you can use the money from that to start your business. And if one day your business doesn't work out, well, look at that. You've got your degree to fall back on. You'll never, you'll never be homeless, you know, stuff like that. And that, that really like hit me back then. And I kind of needed like another push. I, the thing with me is I don't really do things unless I have stress. So like with the whole Pakistan situation, my dad forcing me to do that, I just didn't have a way of you know, saying no, because like, I know my dad would punish me, right, if I, if I did, so kind of just like, put all my, all my concentration in one path, I just, that was, that's all I saw was just passing, right, and I kind of needed like a new pointer, I needed a new hurdle, so I was like, well, if I go to university, then I'm forcing myself to do this, and I won't have a choice, so I'll have to put in the work, and so I remember around that time, um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to go to UC, and do some um, chemist type uh, level degree or something like that. But really around that time, I was working in a pharmacy um, and I was the drug runner. I was pretty much the guy that delivered medications to people's houses. And um, in that time when I was doing that, I used to, I got to have, an, have a feel for the environment that some of the elderly were living in, um, the medications that they were on, um, the health conditions that they had and the loneliness a lot of them felt just being there. A lot of them, their their sons or the daughter has never visited them. They're kind of in this like really terrible um, place where they they need help. They have nurses helping them, and I would stand outside their door and just talk to them for a bit because it really felt like they hadn't talked to anyone for a very long time. So I would I would get in trouble from the pharmacy for coming back late because I'd just be outside talking to a lot of them for a very long time. And it was honestly that that kind of just sparked my um, interest in pharmacy for the very first time. Well, I don't really know what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to do business, but working in a pharmacy and seeing that side of things and I was like you know if I can help these guys out in any sort of a way then I'd feel good about myself as well and that's what sparked me to go towards pharmacy and lucky enough it wasn't I couldn't do that at UC and around that same time when I was thinking about just going to UC doing some lab thing right you came around and you gave that speech and around that time I had one nationals as well for weightlifting and then the Pargo scholarship came through and it's like like everything just kind of just pieced together you know the Otago scholarship your your words of wisdom with my dad's words words of wisdom and everything just kind of just just came in together and it's like okay well let's let's go to Otago uh let, let's get this done so yeah oh that's those are such such great stories they're two very very different stories but but still coming off the eight it's the same outcome I, I'll tell you what I remember so I remember coming to school I remember talking meeting you both and I remember both of you smiling and laughing and having a great time and then I remember you both said to me, yeah, it's cool. We've got the scholarships, um, but we didn't apply for accommodation. I right, so remember that. You're like, if you haven't applied for accommodation, we have nowhere to live. And I remember I said to you guys, if you both email me tonight, we'll make sure we find a place for you to live. And I gave you my cards. It's like, email me tonight and we'll find a place for you to live. And I was like, oh, I don't know if you don't email me. But anyway, you both emailed me. And then I was like, oh, now what do I do? And then that's when I just started to go out there. And then um, 
emailed Charles and I said, hey, Charles, these are some amazing people. You need to take them. And he listened. And then um, that's when you got the offers for accommodation and the ball was back in, back in your court. And then that's when you both both emailed me and we're like, hey, we're coming to Otago. And I was like, quite a what for me, it wasn't about, it wasn't about that you come to Otago. It was the fact that you both, because when I both saw you, you, your reasons for staying in UC were very weak. Like I was like, oh, okay, cool. Those are reasons but they were very weak because I could both see that you were you were hiding behind something like there was uh, there was a hide there but then um when you come to Otago well you know it wasn't just about coming to Otago like it's about you guys actually achieving I remember I said to you both what's the worst thing that could happen you can always come back to you can always come back to you see if things don't work out and yeah and that's the rest is history I guess um so you've made the journey come to Otago I guess in, in a very short short summary what was health that first year for you like both because you both know how before you've come, obviously you've heard about how intense health life first year is. Um, what is it like for you both? I mean, we don't have to go into details, just like short, short summary. I guess um, in a sense, like just going to Dunedin in a sense, like there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad as well. Um, the yeah. good is like kind of like, okay, if, like it's just a bunch of students coming together. No one knows anyone, you know? If you were the shy kid who didn't really talk to many, anyone, you can now be this outgoing, confident guy, you know? And no one would know. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, you can kind of lose yourself as well in, in that sense as well um because you'll start doing things that you normally wouldn't do because you want to fit in try to impress these people who you don't even know um but yeah no but um yeah good good and bad you know you can make a lot of friends um everyone's so friendly down there but with health especially um it's so it's so much work man like i didn't actually realize how much work it was actually gonna be and um and going from high school is such a different experience like high school work-life balance is just like there's no work you know it's kind of like it's just all it's all just it's all just fun and games and then you go to university and it's like wow like wait a minute like I didn't I didn't think things could be this hard I guess um in a sense yeah yeah um yeah adding adding to that or whatnot yeah I feel like Samad's Samad's right because coming from high school and being able to kind of just work study for a test days before and then passing it to coming to health science and then having this thing it, it really just reminded me of like the study ethic and uh that was present back in pakistan which i feel like i feel like high school in that sense depending on what you really want to do it doesn't really set you up properly for what you have to go through when coming to university i feel like there's such a big difference and i feel like that's why it's very hard for some people a lot of people to get in is because this the work ethic you have to put in high school to what you expected in university, depending on your degree, right, is can be freaking it can be like a, a night and day difference, right? Yeah. And the first few things I remember coming in was like, okay, well, this is my goal. This is what I'm gonna do, right? I'm gonna come to university and I'm just gonna study. That was my goal. Coming into O week, right? It's like Samad said, it was coming from Christchurch to Dunedin. It was like a dream come true. I, I didn't really make much friends in high school. I, I was just, I didn't make any friends at all, actually. Yeah. So I was just in the gym. I was just, I used to gym because I had no one to hang out with. So I'd literally just spend my time there. Coming into university, all of a sudden I realized that people are actually nice. People want to be friends. You can actually get along with people. You know, you can, people actually want to talk to you. And it's, it was just such a big difference from the high school environment that I was in. It's like, First few weeks in, I've already had friends that more friends than I've struggled to make in the five, you know, four or five years in in, uni, in in high school. So, and then O week happened, and I realized that Otago has a very good mix of being very very academic and like parties and like all the fun things as well. And so, pretty much when when the O week started. And then when the O week ended, for some people the O week never ends. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like I feel like that's where it gets you. You know what I mean? That's 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 the big trap. Is like you make so many friends, you you, you know so many people, and with that comes all the distractions and and all that. And I feel like the main challenge with coming to university is just finding that balance. You don't want to overdo study and stress you out yourself out too much but you also don't want to be stuck in the opposite end where you're just partying all the time and you're forgetting about study as well which is one thing that i i really i really struggled with um yeah yeah and this is tough you know like like someone said you know um in your first year it's very easy to lose yourself and that losing yourself could be you just because like you said all of a sudden you have all these friends you're like whoa this is amazing and you know um 
before we even jumped onto the podcast, Samad, you spoke about the dopamine hit, and here you have all this dopamine hit just coming. You have all these friends all the time, and you're like, whoa, this is amazing. And it's so, so easy for you to go, this is this is great, and think that's what life is like. Because you go, hey, I've lived a life where this, was, this wasn't around, and you go, this is it. When I meet young people, I always tell people, oh, week is not real university. You have to remember, oh, week is just that one week. But we, like I said, you forget about it because for some people, it's the first time this is, this is they've, met, they've met, they've got friends, not being bullied anymore. They've got their own bedroom, you know, they, whatever, you know, the life situation is totally different. Whereas for others, it's pretty scary. You know, like, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? This is, this is pretty scary. Um, and health side first year, like you, like you both said, health side first year is, is a grind. And I guess for the both of you, the fact that you had that experience in Pakistan where you're like, oh, you had to grind. You're in the grind right here, and um, you both had your you have both had your goals. And you go through the year. I'm sure your year was up, full, of, full of ups and downs. You know, there's life is not linear. You would have ups and downs. You would have had friends. You would have had no friends and all that kind of stuff. There, we're gonna we're gonna fast forward to December after health first year. So December goes on. You December the twentieth, the nineteenth, or whenever you've done your exams. You're now waiting to hear your get your email or letter, whatever you guys got at that time. What's it like for you when you when you've you've done your exams, you've done the best that you can, and now you just wait. It's up to it's up to up to fate, I guess, and up to the people that are the admissions board. What is that like for you both? Or you just you just resign to the fact it is what it is and then when the letter comes, the letter comes. I, I guess like in a sense the, the days where you're like, oh wait, you know, this is it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, but then you know, like it's such a long waiting fit, but then there's also days like you're just doubting yourself, you're like, oh no, you know, it's gonna go the opposite way. And like I feel like that whole long waiting period is just hell for a lot of people. And um, yeah, and no, it was just kinda it was just lots of ups and downs where you're constantly just doubting yourself, but at the same time just having like super high confidence and then doubting yourself. Yeah, it's just a bit of a roller coaster, I guess. I don't yeah, know. You wanna say something about it? Yeah, no, I feel like you're, you're definitely counting down the days and there's, there's a lot of anxiousness because now it's like everything that everything is done. The year has gone, you know, whereas you at the start of the year, you literally felt like it was going to take forever. Now you're at the end of it and you're literally thinking, wow, I could have done so much more. I could have studied more. What the hell? You're thinking about all the things that you didn't do, you know, what I mean? that you could have done. And it's, it's literally like that, like once you've had that experience and you're at the other side, obviously you're a lot wiser, right? And you wish you could go back at the start again with all this wisdom you have now and kind of do it again. And now it's like, man, I could have done this. I shouldn't have done that. I could have done this. I couldn't have done that. And it's like, now you, you're just there and you just have all this wisdom that you wish you could bring back with you. But now it's just that waiting period. Your the suspense is building up. You know, your, your parents are there as well. They're, they're waiting as well for you to say, you know, whatever. And, and you're just there, like looking at the thing every single day, like seeing when it's going to come up. But I remember that night when um, um the results got released and um, uh, my brother was the first to get his and everyone's just celebrating. And, you know, it's like, yes, you know, all that all, everything's done. And I remember my results hadn't come in yet. So I was just in bed and everyone's just kind of just celebrating. And I was like, oh, what the hell's going on? Like, this is, this is kind of funny. Like, um started getting really anxious and like worried for myself because I remember that I had messed around quite a quite a bit first semester first semester was literally like a big mess I just got thrown in the deep end I had stopped studying um throughout high school I didn't have that that base up to date as much first semester was just a bunch of mistakes and I don't know how I pulled through and then during that break between first semester and second semester was a big reflection period for me where it was it was like that time again thinking back to Pakistan. Well, you know, this this is this is my last job. This is all I have, right? And then it's like I'm gonna give it everything. So from all the mistakes I made from first semester, I, I readjusted second semester, um, cut the peer pressure out, stopped going at it so much, just dialing in, dialing in. And I remember that I had done pretty decent second semester to bump up my grades overall. And so now I was just literally just in bed and I was waiting for my results, which were taking forever. And everyone was already celebrating. And I was just there by myself. And I was like, what the hell? This is funny. You know, like, what's going on? And then, like, a thing, or maybe like an hour or so later after my brothers, I got mine as well. And now everyone's like together celebrating. And it was, it was, it was so, I remember so exhilarating just thinking back, you know, thinking back to the start of the year where I had that goal. And then just going through the ups and downs of that year and, and the doubt. And, um, putting like falling apart and putting myself back together and being at the, the end of the night celebrating with everyone else. It was just like a, a big relief 
I feel like for not only me and my brother, but for the entire family, like, you know, we got in, you know, that's what we aimed for. And I feel like after that, it was, it was, it was just amazing feeling because I feel like our, like me and my brother's obligations to our parents had kind of been fulfilled because I know that that their main worry is like for us to be educated and like, you know, get a degree, get a job. And now that we were in, you know what I mean? It was, it was, um, it was good to kind of give them that, that relief that we're going to be fine. You know? And, and that was so cool. And I and I remember when I, I remember when I bumped into you in January, because we don't get told we get to do med school and thing. And this is this is pre before I could find you guys on Instagram and stuff, but this is before all that. And I still remember um still have an idea. And I still remember seeing you getting your at the white coat ceremony. And okay. that's when that's when you told me you're in pharmacy school and some you told me you're in med school. And I still remember seeing your your mum there and she was just gushing with so much pride. Um, it was really, really awesome just, you know. Just for someone who's an outsider to see this is an amazing, amazing gem that you've got, you've gone through to get there. So, um, yeah, it was really awesome to see that there. And someone, how did you feel? Because again, you know, the fear at the start, you've gone through the fear, you get the offer for med school. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think words can describe the feeling. I guess it's probably like probably the most happiest I've ever felt in one moment. I guess the, those 10 yeah. seconds were probably like probably one of the most cherished moments. <laughs> you know, like, I've had, like I don't think I've had that much dopamine ever in my life because it's just like, yeah, constantly like doubting yourself and you, you know, you don't think you're going to pull to. So you, you don't, you, yeah, you, you see all these smart people, you're like, oh, I can't be, you know, I'm not them or whatnot. And then you finally make it to. And I went through like a lot, like, especially second semester, like my health was going downhill, like, especially mental health. And as well as it's like just constant studying. I was like studying like 12 hours a day, which is really bad. Like you shouldn't, you should not be doing that. But with all that studying, my sleep just went downhill as well because I was stressing out too much. I just couldn't sleep as well. And so towards the end of the year, um, like nearing like the exam period, which is probably the most crucial time to be getting good sleep and studying. My, I, I could not sleep for like over like two months, I think. Like, oh, wow. like I didn't sleep a single day. It was that bad. Um, it got so bad. I had like a mental breakdown leading up to my exams because I just couldn't study, couldn't take anything in. And at that moment, like, I think the, the, the associate dean of the, of the college told me to stop studying completely. Yeah. He was like, yeah. you know what, just stop studying completely, just like, you know? But, and like, I, I was about to not even sit my exam. Like, it was that bad. I, I was like, yo, I'm going to like fail this exam. You know, I don't want to sit it. And he told me, no, just, you know what, like, sit it. Because you, if you don't sit it and they don't, like, you know, if your like, application for um, compassionate consideration gets declined, you, you can't do anything. So you might as well sit it. Yeah. And like, yeah, I was kind of like, I just thought I forced myself to sit it, even though I didn't want to, because I thought I was going to do really bad. And when those grades came in, I finally saw that, you know, I I actually ended up doing really well, like a lot better than I thought I would. Um, Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, really, like, I was, I honestly shocked myself. And yeah, and I was qu quite amazing, like, just to like, with all that going on, just thinking you wouldn't, like, and then boom, all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute, how did this happen? It's like a miracle, honestly, like, yeah, it just felt amazing, I guess. What, what a crazy contrast, you know, um, you know, you have about not write the exam and then you go, right, cool, I, I write the exam and I get this top of my head. And as there you go from first semester where you're like, oh, okay, life is great, I'm having a great time, to second semester where you grind and you go, right, cool, this is what I've got to do. But it's crazy how you have to have those paradoxes to actually enjoy or to actually... Thank you for listening to Baskets of Knowledge. Yeah, we hope that you found something useful to put into your basket of knowledge. And as we said before, remember to put something little into your baskets of knowledge every week. And as always, feel free to like, comment and share this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.